Hi, I'm Michelle Lavander, Editor of Reporting on Health. Welcome to our webinar today, King versus Burwell, Obamacare on the Brink. Or should I say, Obamacare on the Brink? Uh, any day now, the U.S. Supreme Court will hand down its ruling on King versus Burwell, a case that threatens to imperil the Affordable Care Act. The latest legal challenge to the ACA hinges on two carelessly written phrases in a nearly 1,000-page law. Polls show that few Americans even know about the Supreme Court case, but they will if the challengers prevail. We're here today with three distinguished speakers who will provide insights on what's at stake and how a court decision could ripple through the healthcare system. Linda Greenhouse, New York Times contributing op-ed writer, and one of the nation's foremost journalists reporting on the Supreme Court, will discuss the implications of the decision for the American public and the reputation of the court. The court, she wrote recently, has permitted itself to be recruited into the front lines of a partisan war. Jay Enghoff, inaugural director of the HHS Office of Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight and a former Missouri insurance commissioner, brings to bear his insider's perspective to share some surprising perspectives on whether a decision for the challengers will be as devastating as we fear. And Jennifer Haverkorn, healthcare reporter for Politico, will offer story ideas for journalists writing on the decision from around the country. I want to thank all of the participants who are joining us on this webinar. A few words on how we'll be spending our hour together. First, we'll hear presentations from our three speakers, followed by a discussion. Then we'll open things up for your questions. Because we have nearly 600 people signed up for this webinar, we'll ask you to type your questions into the question comment field on your webinar control panel, and we'll try to take as many questions as we can. We'll be recording this webinar, and you can access it later, and you can tweet about it at hashtag Health Matters. Now we're going to get going with Linda Greenhouse. Linda, what's at stake for the Supreme Court and the public with this decision? Well, as, as you suggested, Michelle, there's a great deal at stake for both the court and the public, and my focus is going to be the court because other speakers will talk about more about the public. But first, I'm going to put up a slide. The slide is a map, state-by-state state effects. So as people know, uh, the Affordable Care Act set up or offered a mechanism for states to set up the exchanges by which individuals could buy health insurance with the tax subsidy um, that was made available uh, by the ACA. And the expectation, of course, was that states would do this. However, the statute, as people know, uh, included a fallback position, uh, which was that if, state, if the state did not do that, it defaulted to the federal government and the federal government would do it. To everybody's surprise, the red states uh, and some others decided not to do it and to let the federal government do it. So what this slide shows are the blue states, the states in blue are the ones that defaulted to the federal government. So the feds are running uh, those exchanges and the uh, relative small number of uh, what you might call blue states, but they're in gray, uh, undertook to do it themselves. Uh, I think the current number is uh, 13 state exchanges and the rest are federal exchanges. So why does this matter? Nobody thought it mattered at all uh, until um, the people who were very distressed back three years ago when the Affordable Care Act in the basic constitutional challenge was upheld when Chief Justice John Roberts pulled a rabbit out of a hat and upheld the individual mandate as an exercise of Congress's taxation power. Uh, and the Republicans in Congress failed to repeal the act, although they tried, I think, 50 times or more. Uh, so folks who didn't like the law said, what can we do? And they scrutinized the uh, thousand pages that uh, Michelle referred to, and they found they found some language. They found some language in this uh, Section 36B of the Act uh, that, as you see in the text here, talks about how the premiums are to be calculated uh, for health plans in the individual market, quote, which were enrolled in through an exchange established by the state. And they said, aha, uh -huh, that must mean that if the exchange was established by the federal government, it's out of this system and uh, subsidized premiums that the law intended to set up to make insurance affordable for people um, will not 
operate. So they brought a lawsuit uh, after the Internal Revenue Service uh, set out the regulations uh, saying that basically uh, subsidized insurance premiums were not to be made available in the federal exchanges. Now, this didn't make any sense to most people because why would Congress have done that when Congress also, and I'll put up the next slide, uh, in the very same law said that if the state fails to set up its own exchanges, the secretary of HHS will establish and operate such exchange within the state. In other words, the federal government will come and stand in the shoes of the state and do exactly what the state was authorized to do in setting up and, and running the exchanges. So the folks who thought that they had found uh, the magic bullet that was finally going to be shot into the heart of the Affordable Care Act had to come up with a narrative to explain why on earth Congress would have dis would have done such a devastating thing and disable the people living in the multitude of federally run exchange states from being able to afford the health insurance that was the whole purpose of the Affordable Care Act uh, to set up. So they came up with a narrative. And the narrative was that uh, this whole thing was a kind of a carrot and a stick, and uh, states were to be incentivized to set up their exchanges with the horrible stick, if they didn't do it, of disabling their citizens from uh, access to the benefits being offered by the law. The problem with this narrative, of course, is that there's no evidence for it in the statute. There's no evidence for it in the legislative history. And people who were involved in drafting and uh, voting on this uh, law have denied that this was ever in anybody's mind. Now, why, why is this germane to the court case, which is what I'm here to talk about? There's a doctrine um, within the federalism cases that the court has dealt with for many years that if Congress is passing a law that could possibly, if the states didn't behave or, or cross the T's and dot the I's in the right way, that the states would be put under a substantial burden of some kind, there's got to be a clear statement to that effect in the legislation so the states are on notice that they have to do what Congress wants them to do or else they have to know what the or else is. And, of course, there's nowhere in the Affordable Care Act and all of this thousand pages that, that says this. And so uh, one thing that was very interesting is that after the court very surprisingly agreed to hear this case back in November, of course, then we were off to the races, and uh, many briefs were filed uh, in support of the government and, and um, in support of the other side and a number of the government sent to the court briefs, of course, were the, from the expected parties. But one that wasn't so expected, and I think um, it's possibly the, the answer to this problem as a matter of Supreme Court law, was a brief filed by a number of states led by the state of Virginia, including the red states, blue states, the coalition of states, saying, where's the clear statement? You never told us, Congress, you never told us. Uh, that we were putting our healthcare system and our citizens in, in this kind of peril. And consequently, as a matter of federalism, uh, the court needs to, uh, the court needs to strike down, uh, <clears throat> needs to reject the challenge and, um, and uphold the law. Uh, <clears throat> am I, am I, can people hear me? Or am I still, uh, okay. Um, so, What's the stake for the court? If the court agrees with the challengers and the phony narrative that's been put forward, the court really will have allowed itself to be enlisted in a partisan war uh, with a set of legal arguments that would not hold up in any other context. Uh, so what's, what will be very interesting, I'm going to kind of skip over the I won't dwell on uh, these slides about the stakes. We see that the stakes are, are high in this slide because the federal exchanges have enrolled 7.7 .7 million people, uh, more than twice as many as the, as the state exchanges. Uh, premiums will, are likely to go way up if people lose the subsidies. 
but here we have the Supreme Court. It's it's very hard to believe that the court would accept the arguments uh, being put forward in support of the, the phony narrative uh, that underlies this case. But on the other hand, the court agreed to hear the case. The court accepted the case in November in the absence of what's a usual marker for the court to exercise the vast discretion that it possesses in deciding what cases it's going to decide. The typical um, typical marker for the court to hear a case is an issue of law that has created a conflict in the federal circuits. And here the Fourth Circuit, which upheld the law and rejected the challenge, uh, is the only lower court decision that was at issue. The court reached out to decide it anyway. Uh, so we have here on this slide the nine justices who are going to say something about it. Uh, Justice Scalia, as you see him on the top row, second to the left, uh, has recently written in his legislative statutory interpretation cases that you look, of course, you look at the language, and you look at the language in the context of the entire case. So it'll be very interesting whether he is willing to uh, set aside what might be his instincts and his feelings about this law and look at the coherence of the entire statute. Um, I think the case is going to be close. I think there's no chance that Justice Thomas or Justice Alito would uh, vote to uphold the law uh, in, in this context. Um, I think it's quite clear that um, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Breyer, Justice Ginsburg are votes for the government in this case. Uh, so it really comes down to the Chief Justice and as it so often does, Justice Kennedy. So um, we're going to see, certainly by the end of this month, the next time the court has opinion day, uh, the next opinion day that the court is scheduled to hand down decisions is uh, Thursday, day after tomorrow. So I'll stop here and um, listen eagerly to the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, we're going to turn now to Jay Ankoff. Jay, what happens if, if the eighth to the ACA if the government loses? Are we going to have the cataclysmic consequences um, that are being portrayed right now? I don't think we'll have cataclysmic consequences. I don't think the consequences are great, but I think both sides now have an incentive to overstate what the consequences really would be. Uh, I don't think they'd be cataclysmic, and I'll get to that in a second. But first, uh, and I could be completely wrong about this, so I I, I could look in, in tomorrow or when, if they decided on Thursday, maybe Thursday, but maybe on Thursday it'll, it will be shown that I'm completely wrong about everything that I'm about to say. But I just, I just can't see the court striking the subsidies. And I, I agree with Linda's analysis, and I think that the, the, uh, the government has the much better case on the law. But in addition, just look at the interests here. The, the, the court, the, the justices read the papers and they know what's going on. And they're really, as a practical matter, I don't, there are very few people who want the King plaintiffs to win. Obviously, the administration doesn't. Democrats in Congress don't. The governors of states that are in favor of the ACA certainly don't. And obviously, the people benefiting by the subsidies don't. But in addition, the congressional Republicans, for all the noise that they make about how terrible Obamacare is, there, there'd be an, even an, and they love the issue, but they'd be in a much worse position if it was actually struck. Uh, without going into a lot of detail, because there's so many different statements that I could cite, but there was one statement by uh, Senator Barrasso from Wyoming, the thrust of which is, well, we're not going to protect the law, but we are going to protect the people who benefited by the law. That we just tried, that we just struck down. So, it just that the Republicans would just be completely uh, in turmoil uh, if it were struck down. As much as they say they hate the law, they would hate it being struck down even more, regardless of what they say. What about the anti-ACA governors and states that are using the, the federal exchange? Well, they can talk as much as the, and do talk about how much they hate the ACA. But look in the look at the position that they'd be in. If the subsidies were struck, they're not going to want to be blamed for uh, taking subsidies and taking insurance, and in the most extreme cases, 
uh, taking those things away from people and having people get sick, or at least in theory, it could happen that somebody's going to die. I mean, I don't think that would happen, but there, there's the potential for that. The governors don't want to be saddled, saddled with that. The insurance industry is, a, industry is a great beneficiary of the law. I'll get into that a little bit, bit, bit later. They don't want to instruct the same thing with the hospital industry and even business in general, even the Chamber of Commerce, even the business lobbies that are, are, are very anti-President Obama. They, don't, they want the law. In the states, there have been studies done when it, during the time that federal, the state exchanges were being debated, that is, whether to, whether to establish a state exchange was being debated. The Chambers of Commerce and other business groups came out with studies showing how much the law benefited the economy and how much it created jobs and that sort of thing. So even th those groups that you don't uh, typically see as allied with the administration, they don't want it struck down either. So who's left, the, who, who really wants it stru the, the subsidies struck down? The lawyers in the case. Uh, for reporters, it's a lot more fun if, if the subsidies are struck down. And I suppose these consultants who go from state to state, uh, urging, trying to help states set up their exchange, they'd like it struck down. It would give them more business. But otherwise, I really don't see many people, many interest groups that would want it struck down. Okay, but let's say, but I've been asked to talk about what would happen or what HHS could do if it is struck down. All right, so I'll talk about that. Now, I've titled this vaguely previous administration actions, depending on what your views are about the uh, Affordable Care Act, you would either consider these to be uh, routine uh, examples of the administration taking care to see the laws are faithfully executed, or if you're not a friend of the Affordable Care Act, you would say these are violations, clear violations of the statute. So for example, uh, the employer mandate under the statute must take effect in 2014. The administration said, no, it's not going to take effect in 2014. We're going to phase it in. So that doesn't take effect until 2016. The statute clearly says you can't, that plans must be in compliance with the the Affordable Care Act in, in uh, 2014. The administration says, well, no, we can do it for, they can uh, be out of compliance for uh, several more years. There's got to, under the statute, there's got to be one deductible. Plans can't have multiple deductibles. The administration said plans could have multiple deductibles at least for a year. The regulation, the rate review regulation, clearly says rate filings must be made public. Uh, nevertheless, in 2014 and 2015, HHS made no rate filings public. There is no provision to exempt policies from the MLR rule. Nevertheless, in 2010, HHS effectively exempted Minimed policies. Those are po policies uh, providing for very, uh, very uh, low benefits from the MLR rule. The exchange statute says there can be a federal exchange or a state exchange. Nevertheless, HHS by reg has said, no, there are these things called partnership exchanges. So however you uh, characterize those actions, whether they are based on those actions, I think it's a relatively, I don't want to minimize it um, or caricature it, but it's a relatively small step for HHS to do some of these things here. There are already partnership exchanges, and now there's a new entity called a supported state-based exchange. Those things aren't authorized in the ACA. It is at least expressly authorized. It's a very small step for HHS to buy reg or even buy guidance, uh, what's called sub-regulatory guidance, Q's and A's typically, or letters or memos, bulletins from the agency, to say no. So these we, we've looked at we've looked at it, and these partnership or, SA, or state or supported state-based exchanges, if you do if you make these little changes to them, those are uh, state exchanges. Second, HHS just can, by the way, it acts with the uh, with the, uh, the the states, just make it very easy for them to uh, logistically, mechanically uh, characterize the federal exchange as state exchange. It can also put out a reg that defines the key language in the statute, and exchange an exchange shall be a governmental and nonprofit entity established by the state, it can define that it can define that in a very broad way. And also HHS can use carrots and sticks to encourage states and interest groups to cooperate. HHS 
has traditionally used mostly carrots, but it does have sticks and it could use them. Nevertheless, there are problems that HHS can't solve. So, for example, if a state is an ally, if a state wants to, if a state is for the Affordable Care Act, uh, those things that I just talked about are very easy to do. If, on the other hand, this is a second type of state, there are states that are, uh, they'll take our money, but they don't want to be seen with us. If a, st if a state is like that, um, it's still possible, and I think likely, that some of the things that I talked about uh, in the previous slide could be done. Um, states might want a certain might want a certain face saving you know some certain face saving device. They might be want to be able to talk about how well we're not doing it the federal way. We're doing it the Arkansas way or the Oklahoma way because we got something. Um, and th th you can work with states like that. But what happens? Or HHS could work with states like that. What happens though in a state that absolutely refuses to cooperate in any way? And there were states like this, and I'll, I'll give the, the best example I know of is this. In 2010, uh, soon after the law was enacted, it, it became clear under the statute, uh, HHS enforces the law. I'm sorry, the states uh, in the first instance enforce the law. HHS only does if a state, uh, if a state is not substantially enforcing it. And we wrote letters to the states asking them essentially, are you, are you substantially enforcing the law? And some said, oh, heck yeah, we are. Some hemmed and hawed. Uh, some didn't respond. But we just wrote round of letter after letter, round and round of letters to the states, giving them as much opportunity to say, or for us to interpret what they said, as an answer, yes, we are enforcing the law. Only if a state said, heck no, we're not enforcing the law. No matter how many letters you send us, we're not going to enforce the law. Only in that case did we take the position that the state's not enforcing the law. And I think the same thing would happen to, would have to happen here. There'd have to be an absolute high-profile um, uh, message from the state. We are not, we're not going to do anything. We're going to let the, it's totally up to the federal government. You've got to solve the problem. Um, and I'd like to think that when it come, if it were to come down to that, and I don't think it will, but if it were, if it did, that, uh, that there'd be very few, if any, states that would actually take that position. But, but they could, it could happen. Another problem HHS can't solve is there's no more exchange grant money. One of the many uh, stories that the press did not report, or did not report very much, was the fact that the secretary of HHS had unlimited authority to make grants to states. There was no ceiling on that authority. Um, so, the, so the HHS made about $5 billion in grants to states. That money is now gone, or that the authorization is now gone. That expired the, the end of last year. Also keep in mind that even with all that money, the record of states who've established their own exchange is not good. Four of the biggest allies of the administration, Vermont, Maryland, Oregon, and Hawaii, couldn't run their exchanges. So even with unlimited money, the states haven't done a great job. And finally, whatever action HHS takes, uh, I mean, these are not black and white issues. Certainly, it's going to be challenged. Now, there are ironies in the fact that the same people who challenge the law and get it struck down, they would probably challenge HHS efforts to fix the law. But that, that's what's, that is, is what's going to happen if this, uh, I believe, if this, uh, if, if the plaintiffs did win. Okay, so if they won, what I think, uh, if you step, step back from it, look at the carrots and sticks HHS has to encourage cooperation. There are quite a few. There's all kinds of grant money, and not just, uh, I mean, not just the high-profile grants, but Grants to community health centers, to administration, to area agencies on aging, to hospitals, to medical schools, to doctors, to nursing homes. Uh, I don't think HHS would be likely to use all its sticks, but if Lyndon Johnson were running the uh, department, for example, it could. And I think that the states would, I mean, that would be a completely different way for HHS to go then the carrot approach, it's used almost exclusively, but it could go in that direction. The insurance industry, the hospitals, all the interest groups, 
um, have an incentive to make this law work. Uh, and then if you look at, ask the, ask the question the other way, what incentives do they have to not make it work, to make it not work? I don't think much. And the, uh, I, I guess the way I'll end is this. This is another story that I don't think has been covered very much, if at all, in the press. And that is just what a bonanza, what riches this law has created for the insurance industry. If you're just, if you're, you've just uh, invested in an index fund, uh, you've done pretty well over the last five years, almost 70%. But look at how, the, 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 that's the stock, the, the, those are the stock prices. Look at how the insurance industry stocks have gone up. And so I think when it comes down to it, and I mean, the hospitals have profited and others have profited too, but this is more, this is more graphic. So I guess this is um, what, what, what makes the biggest impression on me anyway, as to why I think if the law were upheld, the government and the industry would figure out a way to make it work. But they're, for better or worse, they're joined, not necessarily at the hip, but they're joined. And the industry's got a tremendous incentive to make the law work. And for the same uh, for the same reason, uh, I'll, I'll finish how I how I started. Because of this, because the industry is benefiting, because business is benefiting, because the hospitals are benefiting, I really don't think that a majority of the Supreme Court, and particularly Justice Roberts, uh, would strike the law. So I think that the the, the law will be upheld not just because it benefits people, but because it benefits business. Well, uh, I wouldn't call you cynical, Jay, but uh, that's a really excellent overview. Thank you for this um, somewhat contrarian perspective, which I think has given us a lot to think about. Um, I'm going to turn to you now, Jennifer, and ask you, um, given what Linda's shared with us and Jay, what, what do you expect the basic storylines to be whether the court rules for or against King. Well, hi, everyone. It's great to talk with you today. Um, so let's kind of start off first with what happens the day after a, a, a ruling if the court were to side with the challengers here and against the White House. Um, so HHS has said that there's 6.4 million people who have subsidies in the states that are on the federal exchange, essentially those using healthcare.gov. Um, the Urban Institute has said that about two thirds of them would drop their coverage if they, um, if those people lose subsidies. And I think the, um, you know, immediate reaction is going to be what happens to those people. So if we look at some of the stories that I've been thinking about for before the ruling is what's at stake, starting with those people who are getting the subsidies. Um, and I think there's you know very easy stories to do on who's getting the subsidies now, do they like them, um, are they using their insurance, and, and do people even know about this case? I mean, polls have shown that um, a lot of the public isn't paying attention to this case. They don't know that the subsidies um, could be at stake. Uh, there's been an AP poll and a Kaiser Family Foundation poll that shows like 13% of people are closely following it. So, so while this has taken up a lot of the bandwidth in Washington, I think outside of, you know, DC, um, it's getting very little attention. Um, later, I'll talk a little bit about how to find those people who are getting subsidies. But I think talking to them and just seeing like. Uh, are people going out and using their insurance with these subsidies would be really interesting. The other category of stories I think that would be worthwhile to do before the ruling are contingency planning. And of course this is only really relevant in the states that are um, on the, the federal exchange and uh, people could lose subsidies in. Um, are state leaders doing any prep work in case King wins? Um, uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware just um, got some preliminary approval from HHS to pursue an exchange if King wins. Um, I suspect some other states are, you know, very quietly looking into this, um, uh, particularly in red states, you know, Republicans do not want to be seen as embracing Obamacare, but they're really 
torn right now between they don't want their residents to lose the subsidies that are already getting because they feel like they'd be held politically responsible for that. But they don't want to be seen as embracing Obamacare. So I think um, one of the things they have to consider is, you know, if King wins, do, do, what do they want to do? Um, I think also local hospitals, if they're doing any prep work to prepare for newly uninsured people. Um, and finally, what do members of Congress want to do? Um, that's going to be a storyline that, uh, you know, if, if this goes for King, it's going to be really significant. And I think we might even see some tension between state leaders and members of Congress at the um, uh, uh, within, the, within the Republican Party, excuse me, um, you know, already we're seeing governors say things, uh, particularly Scott Walker in Wisconsin has said things like, um, you know, if, if the court rules for King, that's Congress's problem, they have to fix it. And members of Congress are saying, well, governors could fix this by setting up an exchange. So if it goes for King, that's going to be a battle to watch for and see how it, it's playing out. Um, and I guess finally I would add that in, in terms of stories before the ruling, this really gives us a good news hook to write any kind of ACA story. Um, it's, uh, you know, is the state, is is the law running well in, in your state? How are the insurers responding? You know, rates for 2016 just came out um, in, in a preliminary matter. Uh, what are hospitals doing? Do they, do they like the law? Um, how did people sign up in your state? versus the national level. Um, a, a very high profile Supreme Court case just gives us a very easy uh, news hook to write any kind of story checking in on how the Affordable Care Act is working. And in states with a state-run exchange, obviously it's a little harder because nothing in their state is technically going to change if even if the court rules for King. But I think perhaps that's a story worth writing. Um, I assume that in the states with a state-run exchange, um, exchange folks might be worried that you know consumers might see a headline that says, um, you know, Supreme Court dings Obamacare and interpret that as Obamacare is repealed, and they might be trying to take proactive steps now to to blunt that to ensure that you know people in states like California, where nothing will technically change, are going to be alarmed um, if the court sides with the challengers here. And now after the ruling, um, obviously if King wins, um, there's going to be a lot of attention on this case and tons of opportunities to do stories. But some of the first ones that come to mind is who's losing the subsidies. And obviously that's an opportunity to check back in with the people you wrote about in, in a walk-up story to the ruling. Um, you know, how are they going to respond when their you know, bottom line insurance costs goes from, say, $100 a month to $500 a month. Like, what is their decision making process going to be? Um, all the experts I've talked to said that the first people to leave are going to be the young and healthy people who um, don't necessarily think insurance is something that needs to be a priority in their life. And the people who stay on it are going to be the um, really sick people who, sick or expensive people who really need the insurance coverage. Also, another aspect of that is going to be the shock. Um, those polls that say 13% of people are following this case means that a lot of people, if the court decides for the challengers, are going to be really surprised when they see their insurance bill. Um, and, and that's going to happen very quickly if the court doesn't um, delay any kind of ruling for, for King. And so next is the um, what the governor and legislatures decide to do. Do they decide to set up an exchange? Um, you know, Jay talked about what HHS could do. It's also the governor and legislatures and the states are going to have um, big decisions to make. And does that conflict with their local members of Congress? Kind of getting back to what we were talking about earlier, that there's going to be this conflict between governors and members of Congress. Um, watching that play out, particularly among uh, local politicians, I think will be very, very interesting to watch. Um, and finally, the impact on hospitals, providers, local insurers. Um, uh, the experts I've talked to have said that the smaller insurers are going to be the first ones to see a negative impact if the court rules for King. The larger companies can kind of handle 
the hit, but the, the smaller guys, um, even the co-ops, um, are going to be really, really hard hit if the court rules for King and it goes into effect right away. And if King loses and the White House wins here, there's you know fewer stories to write, obviously, but I think the storyline overall is going to be, is there a sense that the ACA battles are over? Um, we saw this in 2012 uh, after the Supreme Court upheld the individual mandate, and everyone expected that that was going to be the last ACA battle, and then it was, oh, well, we have to wait for the 2014 election, and now we're here again in front of the Supreme Court. So I don't think um, the ACA battles are going away, but I think you know, Democrats and supporters of the law are really going to push that storyline. And I think um, we'll see that play out a little bit among uh, particularly the Republican uh, presidential candidates. I mean, do we see them kind of step back and say the court has ruled twice on this? We need to uh, tweak Obamacare versus repeal Obamacare. I think all that is going to be really interesting to watch out for. And it'll play out among uh, Republicans in different ways in different parts of the party. And finally, I want to include some resources um, that I've found helpful on King's stories. Um, the first is the HHS statistics on enrollment. They break it down by state. That's where the 6.4 million figure comes from. Uh, that's the number of people getting subsidies in states that are um, on the federal exchange. Uh, they also break down the average subsidy in, in uh, a state, which has been helpful. Uh, the attorneys and backers for the challengers have all of their documents listed online. Um, Urban Institute has done some interesting analysis on the um, economic impact. If the court rules for King, um, they're the ones who say that two-thirds of people who are getting subsidies will likely drop their coverage if, um, if they lose their subsidy. Uh, Kaiser Family Foundation and Avalier have done some interesting stuff, and American Action Forum uh, is a conservative organization that has also looked into the fallout. And uh, finally, finding real people, the people who are getting subsidies. Um, I've done these kind of stories in the past, and I found that federally qualified health centers have been really helpful in getting me in touch with people who are getting subsidies. Um, there, a lot of the FQHCs have done a lot of enrollment events, and a lot of the people who are um, getting subsidies are among their clients. So um, they're typically uh, really interested in talking about this. Families USA and Enroll America um, also did a lot of enrollment and have um, been interested in uh, uh, talking about who's getting subsidies. Uh, so with that, I think I'll turn it back to Michelle. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to all of our presenters. That was excellent. We're going to just take a few minutes to have a discussion among the panelists, and then we'll open this up for your questions. And um, I wanted to just start out with a question for you, Jennifer. Um, you know, you mentioned trying to find real people uh, who are getting the subsidies. What, what do we know about them? So. Um, like I said, 6.4 million people, and uh, there was an interesting RAND study, and I actually should have included that. I think it came out uh, in January that kind of looked at who these people are. And um, it, it, well, based on income level, uh, it's middle to lower income people. They tend to be working, um, employed, um, about middle of the road education levels, and Southern. Um, and I thought it was interesting that that, you know, uh, Southern states, um, typically Republican-led states. Obviously, there's some, you know, really interesting political angles to that story. That you know, these are a lot of Republican voters that, or potential Republican voters, I should say, that um, could stand to lose the subsidies if the court sides for the challengers here. And I think that could be some really interesting fodder for some good stories. And. Um we're uh, seeing some news yesterday that the feds have provisionally approved uh, new state exchanges for Arkansas, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. So it, it seems like some of the states are reacting right now. Um, do you expect to see more of that, Jay? Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's not just the states reacting, it's, it's HHS reacting. 
the thing that the people should understand is, eight, and it has nothing to do with the with whether the state exchanges get or federal exchanges get subsidies or not. I mean, in in the entire time I was at HHS, there wasn't a we we wanted the states to do this, but it had nothing to do. There was never a whisper that well, if they didn't do it, in the, in the, 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 the people in that state wouldn't get tax credits in the federal exchange. It just never occurred to anyone. So I couldn't agree more with Linda about how the the, the case is just a trumped up case, but. As I was going to say before being so long-winded, HHS has always wanted the states to do this, to the states to take the lead. And so HHS has always wanted to make it as easy for the states to set up exchanges as possible. And what they just announced on Monday was with, with uh, Pennsylvania and Delaware and uh, I forget what the third state was, that's just going an other step. And if you read what the secretary said is, she essentially said, we're, as long as they promise to do it, we'll we'll uh, we'll certify it. They don't have to. They don't actually have to have done anything, as long as they they have attestations, and and there's an expectation that they'll get it done. Uh, it'll be a state exchange. So I think that's that's really the direction that you'll see HHS go in, and I think more and more states will cooperate with HHS if the King plaintiffs win, which, as I said, I don't think they will. And if I could jump in here, I think um, Jay makes a good point, and I, I guess the other layer of that is the politics of this. I mean, HHS could, you know, make it as easy as possible for a state to become a state-run exchange, but if that's viewed by um, particular Republican governors as embracing Obamacare, the states are not, you know, going to want to do that, particularly I'm thinking about states where Republican governors are running for president. Um, so I think, I think the one challenge here is how easy is it to become a state-run exchange, but also do Republicans want to embrace the ACA? Um, so I think there's I think there's two tracks that these decisions are going to be made on. I totally agree yeah, with this that. Is, this is Linda, I'll jump in too, and just to say that the 13% the number uh, that Jennifer used, the 13% of people are even aware of this case, there's a sense in which, you know, how, how is the ignorance going to play, I think is an interesting question. For instance, uh, when, when some of the congressional Republicans talk about coming up with an alternative and you read the, the, the not even so fine print on the inter alternative and you see it basically would throw people back into the swamp of pre-ACA uh, individual health care policies where you could be denied or you could you know, sell these mini med policies that actually once you get sick don't either don't cover you or they cancel you and all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, people don't don't realize what's out there. Uh, so, you know, when I when I read the details of what some of these proposals are, my heart kind of sinks because they on the surface they look like uh, you know, a viable alternative, but anybody who knows even the slightest bit about the insurance market realizes that they're not that at all. So um I wanted to return to this point that um, came up during the discussion about the amicus briefs and this idea of clear notice. And we're getting some questions from people um, in the audience about the timing of all this. So um, if the Supreme Court uh, rules in favor of the challengers, how quickly does, does all this play out? Um, if if, if uh, HHS says you are now a state exchange, do they just get to keep operating on the federal exchange because they've been deemed a state exchange? I mean, how, how, how do you all see this playing out? Well, as far as what HHS could do, um, I mean, HHS can put out emergency rules and it can also either put out a rule or, or with sub-regulatory guidance, have the insurance industry agree, for example, to, co to continue to, 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 to cover care for, for a certain amount of time or to get, or require hospitals or doctors to continue to give care for a certain amount of time. So, so I mean, if it, 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 even it, it can't be done overnight. If the, if the court were to say we're, we're not to stay the, we're not only to uphold, uh, rule in favor of the plaintiffs, but also to say that the decision takes effect immediately, yeah, then, <laughs> then we'd be in trouble. I don't think anybody would uh, would deny that. I think usually uh, court mandates issue, the, the court order as a formal matter, 
issues in 30 days or so. Uh, so it wouldn't be, you know, the court goes on the bench at 10 o'clock and would announce this, and, and you know, at 10.05, everybody would lose their insurance. Um, no. Uh, but the but time the, couldn't they be, stay at... I'm sorry, couldn't they stay it for six months or a year? Uh, theoretically, they could do anything, but I've never, you know, that, that also would take a majority. So if a majority is willing to, you know, buy into this and, and rule against the statute, um, it would be pretty strange if they would also agree to stay their decision if they had that little faith in, you know, what they were actually doing. So I, I would find that very surprising. And we have a question from somebody named Martha Stevens. And, and just to reiterate to everybody, we're opening this up for questions. And you can type your question into the uh, chat question field of your control panel. And we'll be taking as many as we can. So Martha asks, uh, my understanding was that rulings came down on Mondays. Is this incorrect? But basically, what's your best um, guesstimate, uh, Linda, on the timing here? Uh, rulings at this time of year can come down any at any time. Uh, on the court's calendar, for instance, they'll have decisions on Thursday of this week, and then again on Monday of next week, and maybe a couple more days next week, because uh, they're trying to clear out. I think they've got 17 cases left to decide uh, by the time they finish their term. And I should say, they finish their term when they finish their term. There's no drop dead date. They finish when they finish. Uh, so I, certainly it's, at this time of year, it's not only on Monday. By the way, the best way to follow what's happening at the court is a website called SCOTUS blog. SCOTUS, S-C-O-T-U-S, is short for Supreme Court of the United States. So SCOTUS blog is the go-to site for anything about the court, and uh, they will keep us informed as to what the, the calendar schedule is. And SCOTUS blog has predicted that the ruling will come down June 29th for what it's worth. Um, obviously, that's not scientific, and it, they could be totally wrong. But um, like Linda said, they're the expert on this. <laughs> uh, I, you know, Go ahead. I, Go ahead, Linda. Anybody, anybody's guess is as good as anybody's. So we have two questions um, about circumstances for certain states. So. Uh, Roger Smith for the Center for Health Reporting in California asks, uh, if the court decides for the plaintiffs, what immediate impact would that have on large states with their own exchanges, such as California? What about the long term? And then uh, Daniel Chang from uh, the Miami Herald asks, can you address whether uh, New Mexico, Oregon uh, will be affected by a ruling for plaintiffs? How are these three states different? Oh, there's another one from the 34 where the feds run the exchange. And also, uh, can you tell us whether Arkansas, Delaware, and Pennsylvania will now be exempted from a ruling for the plaintiff because of what happened yesterday? So I can I can take a stab at that one. I think the Oregon, New Mexico, Nevada are kind of um, bubble states, if, if I can use a like NCAA bracket analogy. Um, DOJ and HHS have both said in their briefs that this affects 34 states. So this that would not include those three states. They would count them as state-run exchange states, but you know technically they're not state-run exchange states. So um, it kind of depends on how the Supreme Court were to rule, um, it, it, were their ruling. Um, and I think uh, it's not exactly clear right now. I think if you were to go to HHS, they would call them state-run states, state-run exchange states in order to preserve the subsidies there. But it's really going to depend on what the ruling says. Um, I think if the court does rule for King, those are kind of going to be seen as a model of how a state could quickly transfer from a federal exchange state to a state-run exchange state. Um, and I think if there's any model right now, it would be New Mexico um, in, in the way it was able to transfer over pretty quickly and kind of essentially rent out healthcare.gov and have the look of a, a state-run state. And then in states like California that are running, you know, clearly running their own exchange, um, there's going to be no immediate impact. I think the impact there would essentially kind of just be the general instability of the Affordable Care Act if the court rules for King. Um, 
you know, just Obamacare politics and Obamacare instability is really going to, um, you know, there could be legislation to, you know, restore the subsidies or, or do something in the future of the law that could impact those states, but we have no idea what that would really look like at this point in time. So uh, we have a question from Giselle Grayson from NPR. She, uh, she says, I totally appreciate Linda's analysis, but I've heard some say it shouldn't be viewed as a phony narrative, and the other side does have a serious legal argument. Can Linda help us understand a bit more about how the challengers might prevail? Uh, sure. Um, actually, I don't think there's another side to the phony narrative. The, the, the phony narrative is in service of a certain kind of um, very narrow text-based statu uh, statutory interpretation. So the way the challengers could win as a legal matter is to persuade the court not to look at the statute as a whole, not to see what the congressional effort was and understanding was that they passed this thousand page uh, monstrously large and complicated statute, but simply to look at uh, that slide that I put up about the exchange established by the by the state and to say to the extent that that language goes against the obvious congressional intent, it's simply a glitch. It was a drafting error. And the reason that that would be a, an argument in favor of the plaintiffs is that the court has told us many times in many different contexts that they don't sit to fix drafting errors. If that's all it is, if it's a drafting error, let Congress fix it. Congress made a mistake, but Congress fixed the mistake. Uh, so that you know that that would be that would be the winning argument if the court is willing to stop there and not go any further. Uh, so the you know the reason for the phony narrative is is, is to kind of provide a stronger. Um, more seemingly plausible basis, uh, but uh, you know the, the challenges can could win purely on the statutory language as a glitch theory without the court having to buy into the narrative. A question from uh, another question from Daniel Chang: Who's the arbiter of what defines a state-based exchange? Is it just Health and Human Services? Isn't a regulatory agency's interpretation of the ACA what got us here in the first place? Well, it, in the first instance, yeah, it's definitely HHS that interprets what a state-based exchange is. And there, there's the statute, and HHS can, uh, it can, can interpret that statute. And sometimes it can stretch, and it can stretch the statute, but there's a point beyond which uh, it, it, it probably can't stretch the statute. For example, there is a, uh, I, I haven't read, but I've heard of a law review article which says that okay. even with states that are, that, that, that are totally against the Affordable Care Act and refuse to cooperate, HHS could still deem them to have established a state exchange simply by the fact that they've, uh, that they've done certain things that indicate that they would, uh, I, I think it's a very tough argument to make, and I, and I don't think, so I don't think that HHS can go that far, but HHS can go pretty far. And no, I wouldn't say that HHS. I forget if the second if the second part of that question was well, isn't this HHS HHS's fault? No, I certainly wouldn't agree with that. We have a question from somebody named Catherine Morgan. She writes, "Is anybody going to report on the plaintiffs who represent many of us citizens?" You can have your welfare health insurance program, but make it voluntary and leave me alone. Um, I'd say, yeah, I think, I, I mean, I've written about um, uh, Mr. King and the other challengers. Um, uh, frankly, the lawyers for the challengers have not made them, you know, very readily available, so it's been a little difficult to write about them, but um, I have and other people have, um, and and I think you know any reporting on the polls on the ACA really capture you know the the, the challengers' position here. Um, the the challengers don't want to comply with the individual mandate, and uh, frankly, it's the most unpopular piece of the law. And um, 
it's, you know, why there's still a lot of political hostility over this legislation. Uh, let me say this about, about the plaintiffs. Uh, this is just about the sketchiest bunch of plaintiffs that ever made their way to the Supreme Court, and they're, they're standing to, to have brought this case, standing as a, as a legal matter, is um, extremely problematic. You know, to, to have standing to, to bring a case in federal court, you have to meet several criteria. But the, the, criteria, the criterion that's at issue here, it seems to me, is uh, what's called injury in fact. You have to show that you actually have a concrete injury that's caused by that which you're complaining about. So what is the injury that somebody's suffering uh, because of the Affordable Care Act? They've cobbled up a complicated story, uh, which I won't take the time to go into, but the fact of the matter is that nobody is actually, you can be ideologically injured, you can hate the law and hate the government and so on, but that doesn't give you standing as a legal matter. There's no such thing in, in our system as, as what's called taxpayer standing. I'm a taxpayer and I don't like how the Pentagon is, you know, spending its money on this, that, and the other thing. That doesn't get you into court. You've got to actually show an injury in fact. And it's extremely hard to find anybody with an injury in fact. And that's what's relegated uh, the people that have cobbled up this lawsuit to the kind of plaintiffs who don't give much indication of even knowing what they sign their name to. So, Linda, how likely do you think it is that the court would, would rule against the plaintiffs on standing and just never reach the merits, just say that, that these people have no standing? Well, there's a very attenuated, two of them, I think, actually have, have no standing. Uh, so the one who remains, I forget whether it's Mr. King or one of the other two, uh, has a very attenuated claim uh, that may be totally phony, but it wasn't properly brought out in the in the lower court. So, uh, you know, the Supreme Court's not really in the business of uh, conducting an investigation. So I think they sort of are willing to to take the, the lower court's finding of standing as, as they find it. Uh, but it's just too bad that it wasn't it wasn't fought below because that could have um, taken care of this whole matter. And, uh, you know, I don't think there were two people in the country that actually would have standing actually a, a perfect segue to one of the questions from your listeners um, who asks, is there a middle ground for the court? Is it possible to get a decision that is not completely black or white on the issue of subsidies um, on federal exchanges? I honestly don't think so. Um, you know, it's kind of the up or down question and uh, I think the middle ground lays, uh, lies in, in the various range of responses that, that Jay laid out. Uh, but as a, as a legal matter, um, the federal exchanges either qualify or don't qualify uh, for, for the subsidies. At least that's how I see it. And I'll add to that, I've asked a lot of legal experts the same question, and they've come to the same conclusion as Linda, that there really isn't a, a third scenario that we could be surprised by um, in this situation. It's, it's really for the challengers or uh, for the White House. And um, we have a question from Robin Paoli. Why do you think surveys show such low public visibility for the case? Are we not talking about it enough or reporting on it frequently? Oh, heck, the, the, the reason is, as I think Linda intimated, it's a lawyer's case. It's not a people's case. It's, 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 a, it's a cute case, uh, but, 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 but it's, a lawyer's, it, it's a lawyer's case. It's not something that, that's going to engage, uh, engage people. And as far as reporting on it, I, yeah, I, don't, uh, I think that the press, uh, it, it's the horse race. They're they talk about what, you know, each side and then what could happen if, if this side wins and what could happen if this side wins. But the, the big thing I think that, that has, n has not been reported on at all, by, uh, although Jennifer did mention it a little bit in her opening remarks, is, is the insurance industry's role in all this. The, the, the insurance industry's got a tremendous amount to lose, but nobody ever writes about that. They write about what the Republicans have to lose or the Democrats or the or different states, they never write about the insurance industry. And the, the insurance industry is just tremendously invested in this. And so I'd like to see more reporting on that. 
if there's time for me to weigh in on this, um, you know, I think we have to start from the uh, knowledge that the Supreme Court really has a very low salience with the public. Uh, there's, you know, same-sex marriage, obviously, people know, and the original health care case people knew that was a constitutional case. This really presents as a, as, as a federal regulatory case. It's purely statutory. Uh, and I think people going about their ordinary business just cannot imagine uh, the Supreme Court swooping in and undoing this structure. And so there's a certain cognitive dissonance, I think. They might have heard about it in one ear and out the other because it just makes so little sense that we've, that we've come to this. Well, I want to um, say I, I think our, our webinar has come to a close. I want to thank our three excellent presenters, Linda Greenhouse, Jay Ankoff, and Jennifer Habercorn. This is Michelle Evander from Reporting on Health. We will be sending you a quick evaluation um, that asks for your feedback on this session as well as your ideas for future webinars. We ask you to take a moment to fill that out as it really helps guide us going forward. Additionally, um, we, we should let you know that we will be putting on Reporting on Health the PowerPoints from all our presenters. We already have up some resources that um, different speakers have referenced, and the recording of the webinar should be up in the next day or two, and you'll be able to access it through our site or YouTube. Thank you again to all of you, and um, this has been a wonderful presentation. Have a good afternoon.